Ken Sugimori is a manga artist, video game designer, illustrator, character designer, and art director. He is responsible for bringing the first generation of Pokemon to life, and his style has become synonymous with the franchise. His distinctive use of watercolors, coupled with his hand-drawn line work, bring the people as well as the creatures of Pokemon to life. But who is Ken Sugimori? How did he get involved with Pokemon, and where is he now? Find out as we deep dive into the life and works of Ken Sugimori. Ken was born in Tokyo, Japan on January 27, 1966. Growing up, Ken was a fan of heroes such as Ultraman, and his love for anime and manga gave him aspirations of pursuing a career in animation. In an interview, he recalls a time where his school hosted an art contest. We were all supposed to draw pictures of our schoolhouse when I was in my second year of middle school, but I was obsessed with anime, so that's the style I drew it in, and they hung it up on the wall. As Ken grew older, he continued with his sketches, and it was at this time that he shifted his focus away from anime and towards manga. He mentions that during this time in his life, he made a version of Spaceship Yamato he called Spaceship Tomato. While still in high school, Ken's first manga was published in Weekly Shonen Sunday, a weekly manga magazine that still exists to this day. These early accomplishments would only further Ken's drive to pursue a career in illustration. One day, while browsing a doujinji shop, Ken found an issue of Game Freak, a video game magazine handwritten and self-published by Satoshi Tajiri. Ken immediately saw the potential in the publication and recognized its need for an experienced artist. After meeting with Satoshi, Ken was hired on as a freelancer for the publication. Ken's art added a level of professionalism to the magazine, and soon Tajiri would need to hire a publishing company to keep up with the rise in demand. With business booming, Game Freak stepped its toe into video game development and released its first video game, Quinty, for the Famicom. It was a success, even getting a manga adaptation illustrated by Ken. Game Freak would release two more titles within the following 24 months, Jerry Boy and Yoshi, the former of which would also receive a manga illustrated by Ken. This marks a pivotal moment in Ken's life. Up until now, Ken wasn't an official employee of Game Freak. The artwork he made for them was done on commission. On top of that, Ken was working in other ventures in the manga industry, mainly Jerry Boy and Quinty. When asked about this time in his life, Ken goes on to say, While I had my regrets of living the lifestyle of a manga artist, I honestly also felt I was at my limit. On the other hand, it was really fun working with Game Freak. It was at this time Ken was asked to work at Game Freak full-time, an offer which he happily accepted. During the next two years, Ken would help with the development and release of four more games, Magical Taru Ruto Run, Mario and Wario, Kuru Kuru Puzzle, and Pulse Man. Ken was not only working as a video game designer, but also as a director for Game Freak. And with a few successful games under their belt, they could finally shift their focus on creating the game that would change everything. Pokemon Red and Green, later released in the US as Red and Blue, would take the world by storm, and Ken is the illustrator who brought these Pokemon to life. His distinctive pen on paper line work coupled with his use of watercolors would set the tone for the Pokemon franchise for generations. But how did we get here? Ken and Satoshi saw the potential of helping a friend out by trading via the Game Boy's link cable. This coupled with Satoshi's love for collecting bugs as a child was the spark for what Game Boy is today. When tasked with coming up with the first monsters, Ken drew inspiration from the kaiju he watched Ultraman fight as a kid. I had never drawn monsters like that before, and I was honestly pretty lost. But I managed to create about 20 or 30 different designs. Some were cute, some were cool, some were slithering, and some, well, you really couldn't tell what they were. As gameplay and story developed, other members of Game Freak were tasked with designing the Pokemon as well. Ken oversaw this process and finalized the creation of all 151 of the original Pokemon, creating many of the monsters himself. If Ken liked a Pokemon someone created, he would redraw it, making slight alterations so that the overall look for the Pokemon world would remain consistent. This also means that all of the official artworks done at this time were hand-drawn by Ken. When designing a new Pokemon, Ken prefers doing research on real animals so he doesn't distort the Pokemon or leave anything out. If I'm drawing a Pokemon based on a bird, I need to properly research a bird's skeletal and wing structure. It would be embarrassing to make a mistake. 
Ken combines his research with his ultimate goal of showing a player a creature that not only feels new, but is also memorable, often redrawing a Pokemon several times until he feels he got the proportions right. He tells his team members not to make Pokemon that look too edgy, and he encourages additions that take away from a Pokemon's coolness, saying that if it looks too cool, it takes away from what makes it memorable for the players. After a successful launch in the West, Pokemon would go on to have an official TCG release less than a year later. Without the limitations of a game console, the TCG gave Ken's art a chance to be the focal point for gameplay. Nearly half of the cards released with base set were drawn by Ken. Ken's base set cards nearly always featured a Pokemon large and in the center of the artwork. Ken would draw and color the Pokemon featured on these cards, but he didn't make the background. In 2021, a Twitter user by the name of Fanimal discovered backgrounds for the cards on a stock image website used for Japanese media. Often the source files were slightly distorted before making it onto the card. Here's an example that I recreated using a Pikachu drawn by Ken and a stock image of a lightning bolt found on this website. After adjusting it slightly, you can see how this card was made. This format would carry on through Jungle and Fossil, but with the release of Team Rocket, you can see his style begin to change. While there are still some cards with the Pokemon blown up and in the center of the card dropped on a background, other cards begin to feature Pokemon and people in more dynamic poses. Once Gym Heroes and Gym Challenge were released, we could finally see Ken loosen up and produce incredible art. His experience as a manga artist shines through in this set, as his cards tell a story at a glance. Take the card Good Manners. Erica is off-center. Her body is facing away from you while she looks over her shoulder peeking at you through her hair. For some reason, this random trainer card always stuck out to me as a child. And that reason is Ken's ability as an artist. Also new are cards featuring people interacting with their Pokemon. Cards no longer feel lifeless or two-dimensional. This art has depth in more ways than one. On top of that, Ken does something simple yet incredible. He shifts the Pokemon off to the side. This use of negative space makes the Pokemon feel as if they are in a much bigger world than themselves, and in a way, it humanizes them. Ken's art in this set is nothing short of iconic. Ken has done more card art than any other illustrator with a catalog that boasts more than a thousand cards. Since the release of the first games for the Game Boy, Ken has stayed on as the main art director for the franchise. For every new series of Pokemon, his team designs hundreds of creatures, most of which never get used. We probably design around three times more Pokemon than we actually intend to use. Each designer brings in rough sketches of their designs, I meet with them individually to discuss certain features of their designs, and they bring them back with revisions. If the Pokemon makes a cut, I will draw its official art. As Ken draws the final draft for the Pokemon, his goal is to keep the look of the franchise consistent while also maintaining the artist's concept and individuality. Much like the Pokemon he draws, Ken's art style has evolved over the years. Ken transitioned away from using watercolors and started digitally coloring his Pokemon. One thing that hasn't changed is Ken's insistence on doing the Pokemon's outlines on paper before scanning them in and coloring them on the computer. He enjoys the sensation that comes with moving his G-Pen across the paper, and he loves the look of rough and inconsistent lines. He takes pride in the fact that his illustrations are hand-drawn, believing perfect vectored line work loses charm along the way and looks boring. Despite the success of Pokemon and by extension Ken, Ken often downplays his abilities in interviews. He even attributes the low standards of early video game companies as the primary reason he was offered the job in the first place, saying explicitly that it was a brand new industry back then and the standards were lower than in other fields. Ken mentions in a separate interview that because of the talented artists flocking to the industry today, he often feels inadequate when he compares his art to newcomers, and he worries that one day he will outlive his usefulness. Pokemon's continued success has also led Ken to feel conflicted about the path he has chosen. On one hand, he has a successful career, while on the other, his legacy will always be tied to this franchise. If I were to continue drawing for Pokemon, I'm sure it would bring a sense of peace and security. But I also wonder what would happen if I were to do something completely different. An art book released in 2014 titled Ken Sugimori Works perfectly illustrate that Ken hopes he is remembered for more than just Pokemon. Of the more than 350 pages featuring projects he has worked on, only 20 
were dedicated to Pokemon. Ken Sugimori provided the art that captured people's imaginations and brought the world of Pokemon to life. In addition to that, the Pokemon he helped create inspired generations of artists to pursue a career in illustration, and his story teaches us what never giving up on that pursuit can look like. Ken could have led a different life, one where he focused on a career in manga, but I can confidently say that Pokemon would not be where it is today without Ken Sugimori. And had he not picked up that issue of Game Freak all those years ago, it is possible that Pokemon would not exist at all. I want to thank everyone who made it to the end of this video, and I want to give a special thanks to fellow YouTuber Dr. Lava. His translated interviews help make this video possible. Links to his channel, as well as all sources used, are in the description. I encourage you all to like this video and leave a comment down below letting me know about artists you might like to see covered in the future. And don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss the next one.